to obstruct. I always said it would have been a ridiculous idea. I wouldn't have fired Comey when he did. So we have sources tonight just confirming to Ed Henry that, yeah, maybe Donald Trump wanted to fire the special counsel for conflict. Does he not have the right to raise those questions? I think that it indicates yet again that there is clearly something that Donald Trump wants us not to see, that he clearly has something to hide. But what we really have here, Trump didn't fire anybody. Not firing someone doesn't sound like obstruction to me. Is the press going overboard on what the president contends is fake news? A fierce media debate over the Russia probe and loaded text from rogue FBI agents with some commentators harshly attacking the bureau. It may be time to declare war outright against the deep state and clear out the rot in the upper levels of the FBI and the Justice Department. Yes, I said the rot. When you have Fox News declaring war, in their words, on the FBI and the Justice Department, the deep state there, when you have people talking about secret societies inside of the FBI, that's that is out of what Erdogan's playbook. Is the media speculation about Mueller out of control? And are some commentators going too far in trashing the FBI? Casino mogul Steve Wynn out as Republican finance chairman after the Wall Street Journal reports serious allegations of sexual misconduct, which he denies. Will the press give him the Harvey Weinstein treatment? My book, Media Madness, is making news about the war between the president and the press, and we'll drill down on that. Plus, Megyn Kelly, long after a dust-up over plastic surgery, takes on Jane Fonda and her role in the Vietnam War. She still says she is not proud of America. So the moral indignation is a little much. This is no longer a feud about facelifts. I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. After media reports that Robert Mueller had asked for a high-stakes interview, President Trump unexpectedly told reporters, well, he's looking forward to it. And when he was asked at the Davos conference about the New York Times report on his having tried to fire Mueller, Mueller, Mueller last June. Do you want to fire Robert Mueller? Fake news, folks. Fake news. What's your message today? Typical New York Times fake stories. Joining us now to analyze the coverage, Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist and a Fox News contributor. Shelby Holliday, senior video reporter for The Wall Street Journal. And Capri Cafaro, a Washington Examiner contributor and former Democratic state senator in Ohio. Molly, the New York Times report has been confirmed by The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, NBC, CNN, Fox News, and others. That doesn't sound like fake news. Well, you have, it's difficult to say confirmed when you're talking about anonymous sources, which is what we always rely on here. But you have anonymous sources saying that Donald Trump thought about firing someone or wanted to fire someone who he's legally allowed to fire, but he didn't fire. And this is a story that was reported in June, in September, in December. So why is this big breaking news that we're reporting it yet again? I get the feeling people are forgetting that this was already reported before. Well, because of the fresh news, if you believe the sources quoted by all these organizations that Don McGahn, the White House counsel, said, I'm resigning if you go through with this plan. Okay, so again, he didn't fire someone who he's legally allowed to fire. Right. And this is treated as big news. And I think we need to take a step back and look at why it's being treated as big news. You have the House Intelligence Committee prepared to release a report about FISA and surveillance abuse at the Department of Justice and FBI that members of Congress say is chilling, criminal, really disturbing. And you also have no evidence of uh, collusion with, the, with Russia between the Trump administration and Russia after a year of being told that this is what it's all about. I think what you're seeing in official D.C. is a bit of panic and fear about the lack of substance to the Russia investigation and worry about what's going to come out of this report. But Capri, yeah. since President Trump denied last summer that he was even thinking about firing right. Robert Mueller, and uh, his pal Chris Ruddy of Newsmax went on PBS at the time and said it was under consideration. Right. So some journalists, some liberal commentators are now saying he was not telling the truth at the time. 
Well, I mean, obviously, it seems that President Trump and, and some of his closest allies are maybe saying one thing and then saying another thing. That's certainly not, um, you know, I think unique. Um, we've seen President Trump change his mind and change stories, you know, uh, time and again. I do think, though, that what is, is happening, not so much, I, I disagree a little bit as far as the media u utilizing this, bringing the story up again um, to deflect from something else, but rather I do think that they, there is a concerted effort to create a narrative across, you know, different media channels, essentially to say that this is a pattern. This is a pattern that President Trump wanted to, you know, fire Mueller. No, he didn't. But, uh, you know, and the reason why he didn't is because Don McGahn uh, said he was going to quit. We saw the same thing with the FBI uh, director reportedly saying, uh, and there was coverage all around that, saying he was going to he was going to quit if he was, you know, further, let me, uh, let, let you me know, jump with in McCabe. And, let me get, jump in and get Shelby. So the New York Times said his story was based on four unnamed officials. Mm -hmm. The White House didn't deny it. Don McGahn, the counsel, didn't deny it. President's lawyer, Ty Cobb, said he wasn't going to comment on it. That's not what we in the business call a hard knockdown. No, it's not a hard <laughs> knockdown at all. And that's part of the reason this story was such a big bombshell. You mm -hmm. cannot deny that this was significant news. Uh, as Capri was saying, it's all about patterns. If you talk to legal experts, they say patterns are everything for prosecutors. And so this is just evidence of another attempt uh, by President Trump to knock down the special counsel, to knock down the investigation. He did not take that step. And so it is worth noting that. But patterns are big. From a media perspective, this was big news, not just because of the legal aspect. There are parallels to Watergate, but oh. also because... Mm -hmm. The president has been denying this. His team has been denying this. Okay, but Molly, you for say months. it's not that big a deal because parts of it have been reported before and it's unnamed mm -hmm. sources, and he didn't fire Robert Mueller. But would you agree that if he had, a month after firing Comey, this would have been a political and legal firestorm that would have just absolutely rocked this city? Well, I guess I'm more interested, again, in the, in the media takes here. And for a year, we've had the media monomaniacally claiming that there's collusion between Trump and Russia. We have no evidence of that. We have now, two people who have lied to the FBI about their contacts sure, with we have Russia. No evidence so there is evidence. There is evidence. So and, there is and, evidence. Uh, we, have no, we have no evidence of treasonous collusion with Trump to steal an election, which is what right. these stories have said nonstop, day in and day out for a year. Right. Now we have news that the Mueller probe is not they, they leak pretty regularly they're not leaking anything about russia collusion they're leaking about, about obstruction. obstruction and the media are just taking that and running with it as if they are the dutiful servants of the Mueller probe instead of thinking about how right. the story that they've been pitching for a year is well, and, and I, I think that, you know, the, the big problem, frankly, is that, you know, we're litigating this issue in the court of public opinion. The media is not doing a service, in my opinion, to this investigation because they continue to stir the pot. We need to let, if they really care about the outcome of this investigation, they need to let it take its course and not okay, continue to, we like, live rip in it a apart. 24 7 I know. Media world where everybody Twitter. has to analyze everything. <laughs> and look, the president doesn't have many defenders on this particular story, but. It is true, uh, despite all the headlines and all the cable news segments, you can't build an obstruction case by built, pointing to a firing that never happened. Right, I mean, exactly. You can talk about intent, but that's Well, you also can't lines. really build a great obstruction case if there is not, well, you can, but the bar is very high. There has to be an underlying crime, a lot of legal experts right. say. All right, in I want to get away from the legal analysis. What about Molly's forward? point that after a year and all these investigations and all these Hill committees, that there is no hard evidence of collusion with Russia, and therefore the media have moved the goalposts and are now saying, well, but he uh, possibly obstructed, the president did, or he's acting like he has something to do. So I'm not, I'm not sure the goalposts have changed. From the beginning, since pre the president fired Mo uh, Comey, there have been two prongs of this investigation, obstruction of justice and collusion. Neither of those Would you say the emphasis have been has concluded. Would you the say emphasis the in the coverage Lately, has changed. Yes, it has the changed. emphasis in the coverage okay. has changed. But sure. collusion not... is actually not a crime. Treason does not apply. But, but there collusion lot, has been the subject of, of millions and millions anyway. and millions of words right. by news organizations. And also, the entire right. probe is, uh, is, is the result of a campaign to claim treasonous collusion with Russia to steal an election, mm -hmm. and claims uh, that were made by intelligence and law enforcement agencies that are now under scrutiny after a year of congressional investigation, and we have reports coming out alleging serious wrongdoing by federal employees as it relates to this. Well, we have and those folks have story, been removed. Let me ask coverage. you this, Ma, because now we have, I mean, here's uh, something Sean Hannity said the other night, uh, talking about Justice Department and FBI, people must be held accountable, investigated, indicted, probably many of them thrown in jail. So. Mm -hmm. Fox has come under attack uh, regularly by some at MSNBC for beating up on the FBI, Justice Department, Deep State. Now, it's not Fox News. It is certain commentators at Fox News, Lou Dobbs, we showed earlier, Sean Hannity, Judge Dean, others, people who are paid for their opinions. Nevertheless, does some of this go too far? 
I think the narrative that if you are critiquing certain bad actions by certain people in the leadership of certain agencies, that you are therefore tarnishing everybody in the agency, that's a straw man argument. And it also indicates, again, that people don't want to deal with the very real issue that congressional committees are coming out with reports alleging serious wrongdoing by federal agencies. That is their constitutional congressional duty. Congressional committees or Devin Nunes? Well, and, but I do, I do think, though, that I mean, this issue of the text messages between the, the two you know, star-crossed lovers at the FBI going back and forth has gotten extensive coverage. Well, we're going to talk about that later. So let me let me flip Molly's argument and see what you think. Um, the people who are ripping the commentators, including mm -hmm. some of this network, who are ripping the FBI and Justice Department, they say they're holding the bureau accountable. accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, they're liberal detractors. People on your side saying, well, no, they're just trying to discredit the Trump investigation. Uh, I think there, there's a valid argument to be made on both sides. I mean, I think that certainly, as, as you mentioned, Howard, I mean, these folks are entitled to their opinion, uh, even though they are part of a news organization. You know, there is some editorial license that they can take. But I do think that there's something to be said to potentially speculate that, uh, you know, if you undermine those that are investigating um, and you say that they are not credible, therefore that investigation becomes uncredible because those people are no well, longer speculation trustworthy. Speculation is something I try to avoid, but certainly a lot of Democrats during the Bill Clinton impeachment that tried to discredit Ken Starr. But Shelby, True. even some conservatives like former Fox News contributor Bill Kristol of the Weekly Standard say Fox opinion people are going too far. But then you have to factor in the people like Crystal despise Donald Trump and, ha and have since the campaign. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with this being a 24-7 news cycle. There is this obsession with instant gratification. Everyone mm -hmm. wants to know everything immediately. We don't have all the facts. We don't have all the texts. We don't know what's in Devin Nunes' memo. So to light uh, some partisan charcoals on fire and make it this massive wildfire before we even know all of the facts I, I is mean, irresponsible. The, the idea, it does undermine the idea that it after does a undermine year, democratic institutions. The idea that after a year of running story after story based on nothing but a non sources. It's and now you have an actual well, committee putting its name behind it. It's hundreds of thousands, fair to of, question of, conduct hundreds of thousands of documents they've reviewed. Now say, oh, that's oh, not enough yeah. substantiation. But after running wild, anonymous sources, sources in general. It is unbelievable. Uh, okay. Okay. If this report, FBI, if and when this report is made public, we will talk about it uh, ad nauseum. All right, when we come back, Las Vegas billionaire Steve Wynn quits the RNC after multiple allegations of sexual misconduct. Will the press demand that the party return his money? And death threats against CNN sparked this question. Is President Trump somehow to blame for a crazy caller? Happens when the President of the United States, Donald Trump, repeatedly attacks members of the press. When you make that baseless and incendiary charge, be aware that people are listening to you, some very dangerous people. A Washington Post column by Kathleen Parker was headlined, Is Trump Inciting Violence? Joining us now, Emily Jashinsky, a commentary writer at the Washington Examiner. And in New York, Kathy Aru, publisher of Catalina Magazine and a former Washington Post magazine editor. Emily, so a 19-year-old guy whose dad says he doesn't even own a gun uh, threatens to shoot up CNN. And that's scary. It's scary stuff. But Don Lemon and others are blaming it. On Donald Trump. Right. Well, no, this is, of course, scary. Thank God nothing materialized of this. He was caught. But I don't think there's anything specific you can point to that Donald Trump himself has said or done that is directly inciting violence. Now, I'm happy to look at some things, you know, like Sheriff David Clark saying you punch the lion lib media in the face to make them taste their own blood. I think that's an example of rhetoric that does go too far. I don't love when Trump calls the press the enemy of the people. But, you know, for the most part, I don't think you can point to anything specifically and say this incited violence. This is responsible for that. That's too far. Kathy, how are these threats the president's fault somehow? Well, I mean, the president continually calls CNN fake news, and he's uh, put out videos showing that he's beating up fake news and wrestling with uh, the fake news of CNN. So he's calling Jim Acosta a fool, who's a reporter over at CNN. He repeatedly mocks CNN and says these horrible things, and he doesn't understand the power of his words and the power of the presidency. And he has a tool, unlike any other president, to get his message out. He has Twitter and 47 million followers. But how is mockery... I'm just wondering how mockery can be held responsible for violence. Well, the president of the United States is saying these horrible things about this organization, and and he's tell and some people are interpreting it as let's take care of the situation. Well, okay, they're, some they're people are angry. some people are interpreting it as let me let me come go to Emily and I'll come back to you, Kathy. Yeah, you can say the president shouldn't call CNN fake news. Right. You can say uh, that kind of thing breeds disrespect. That's a perfectly right. normal debate to have. But how is any politician responsible for nut jobs who threaten or commit violence? Right. No, and I almost think it takes away the responsibility of the awful person 
person who was making these threats in the first place. I mean, especially when we looked at the tragedy that unfolded on the baseball field this summer. And, you know, people's that was obviously someone, a progressive, who went too far, took that rhetoric too far. I think we all need to bring the rhetoric down. But I think unless you can say that specifically is violent, that's a different thing. And Kathy, I, I just hate the blood on your hands sort of guilt by association arguments. And I didn't like it when uh, during the Obama administration, a police officer would be shot and some would blame it on Barack Obama's rhetoric. So it's scoring right. political points. Uh, uh, are you but edging into that territory now? Well, but the, this man did make these threats, and he was quoting the president's words when he was making the threats. He was calling it fake news, which we all know came from the president himself. That has term. nothing to do with violence. It, well, he, he, he's a violent person who was going to do violent things to CNN based on the words of the president fake. of the, the United States. Fake. The word fake. The, the fake term news fake news. came from Donald Trump. That but how does that incite Trump. violence? I, I fail to understand how that you can connect that but to inciting violence. It, it did. It, it incited, this person was motivated by the words that came out of the president's mouth. But why is that Donald mouth. Trump's fault? Donald Trump told this person that this is a fake news organization. Right. This person interpreted it as We are I'm going to, to uh, agree to disagree with the two of you on that point. I want to get to Steve Wynn, the casino mogul. Uh, he's resigned as the RNC national finance chairman after the Wall Street Journal reported numerous allegations and accusations of sexual misconduct, which he denies accusations, including that he forced employees to have sex over the years. Um, will the pundits, Emily, now demand that the RNC return Steve Wynn's donations the same way it was done with Harvey Weinstein and the Democrats? Yes, they are, and they should. And listen, I'm a conservative who put a lot of heat on the DNC after the Weinstein uh, revelations in October. Um, I think that was the appropriate step. I think it's the appropriate step now. This report is discussing. And unlike Harvey Weinstein, Steve Wynn had a formal position with the RNC, the finance chair. So, I mean, that ev makes it even more of a problem. Right. There was one Washington Post story online today saying he's questioning whether he should give the money back. And Kathy, Fox News, which had Wynn co-host a network special recently, uh, now says it will no longer use him as a guest. Will we see a media drumbeat, as we did with Harvey Weinstein, will the Democrats give the money back? What's Hillary got to say about this? Uh, now that Steve Wynn is at least accused of this kind of misconduct uh, and has had to, and actually had the formal tie of finance, national finance chairman, which he's given up for the RNC. Right. We, we haven't seen it yet, so we, we don't know. It's still unfolding, but I'm sure. Well, are you willing to say it right now? Um, yeah, I'm willing to say that the media will, will do the same with Wynn that it did with Weinstein. We will see the media do it because the media is great at doing its job and uncovering these problems. And yes, they've gone after everyone who has been uh, found guilty. So I don't think there's going to be given any different treatment to Wynn that was given to Weinstein, especially it's, it's an all unfolding. And yeah, it, it sounds like a, it's a real story here. There's one so tiny why, difference from the press point of view, which is that Harvey Weinstein's victims, many of them were famous actresses. And right. so I think that helped fuel the story. Great debate. Emily Jaschinski, Kathy Rue, thanks very much for joining us this Sunday. Thanks. Ahead, behind the scenes in the war between the White House and the press as we look at some of the disclosures in my new book. But up next, a Media Buzz exclusive, how a major media blunder about Jared Kushner's company blew up, but corrections were hard to come by. Owned by the president's son-in-law. Jared Kushner's firm tied to suspicious transactions at German Bank. And it ricocheted around the world. New York's Daily News. Deutsche Bank looking at suspicious Kushner transactions. Report. Huffington Post. Report. Deutsche Bank flags suspicious Kushner company transactions. These stories and more based on a report by a German publication, Manager Magazine, charging that the giant Deutsche Bank, a major lender to Kushner's firm, as well as Donald Trump's company, had identified suspicious transactions related to Kushner family accounts. And what's more, the company had turned over the information to German bank regulators and was reportedly willing to give it to Robert Mueller. But then Deutsche Bank called the story wrong and said it is taking legal action. And the bank telling me yesterday, we have not submitted any report concerning suspicious transactions on a written or an oral basis to regulators, as suggested by Mag Manager Magazine. We are confident that this false reporting will be corrected soon. Mother Jones, which had called Jared's personal lawyer for comment, but not the Kushner companies, included the bank's statement as an update at the top of the piece, along with a corporate statement that Kushner companies has done nothing wrong. There's been no contact by the special counsel. There is no money laundering and no Russian connection. But strangely, Mother Jones kept the same headline about Kushner firm tied to suspicious transactions. Mother Jones didn't address the headline question, but told me that since we accurately reported the contents of the Manager Magazine story, which it is standing by, and included prominently and in full the Deutsche Bank and Kushner Company denials, we see no need for a correction. 
Now, some other outlets did do stories on the bank's strong denial. By the way, Kushner tried to distribute its press release through PR Newswire and was turned down. PR Newswire telling me that's because the release threatened legal action, which could move markets. The Kushner firm told me the German report and other totally incorrect stories are a distraction. Quote, this is just one example of some of the media's distortion of reality and lack of basic rules of professionalism, sometimes not even bothering to contact us before running with a story or waiting for our response. The media's obsession with attacking the company because Jared Kushner works for the president is outrageous. And the German magazine, now in discussions with Deutsche Bank, has abruptly deleted its piece. Ahead on Media Buzz, Jane Fonda keeps complaining about Megyn Kelly's plastic surgeon question, and now Megan's fighting back. But first, are both sides damaged by the relentless battles between the president and the media? Look at my book, Media Madness, in just a moment. Washington Post to Axios to Politico, from the Hollywood Reporter to the Drudge Report, I have to modestly report that my new book, out tomorrow, already in its third printing, is making some news. It's called Media Madness, Donald Trump, the Press, and the War Over the Truth, and Molly Hemingway is back with us. So I tried to tell the inside story of the Trump White House based on exclusive reporting, without an agenda, examine why the coverage of the president is so overwhelmingly negative. One of the things I do is look at what reporters say privately or their pals on Twitter. So when the president pulled out of the Paris climate deal, Wall Street Journal's Eli Stone Locals tweeted, upending the global order and threatening the planet entirely to appease your own base after four months in office. Uh, he did delete the tweet after Sean Spicer complained. Yeah, it's funny. You talk to a lot of people in the media who are upset that they are portrayed as hostile to the president, as if they don't realize that we can read these tweets that they're putting out or see, see how they frame their stories and whatnot. But I just want to commend you. This was a, such Thank a fun you. book to read, and it has so much salacious detail. It has really good intrigue about what's happening at the White House. And yet, because you play it down the middle and you don't take sides on who's right, who's wrong, who's good, who's bad, you just can really enjoy and trust this read. And whether you like Trump or whether you dislike Trump, there is plenty in there. And it's just so rare that you can actually do that, so that you can find a Thank writer you, who does that. So I just that, wanted to... That means a lot to me coming from you. Uh, one of the figures in the book is Ivanka Trump, who always got good press until the campaign. And she was sort of stunned to realize when she came here to Washington that uh, her liberal friends wanted her to ease their pain. And when she was supposed to contradict her father's public positions on issue after issue, even though he was elected, she was not. Uh, and every time there's a, there was a decision on a conservative social issue, somehow she got blamed. So, for example, columnist for Media I wrote, this is one of many, uh, Ivanka's unwavering loyalty to a self-admitted sexual serial abuser and crude-mouthed misogynist. Uh, so she's getting uh, a lot of press for decisions that she either had a little input in or didn't have anything to do with. Right. And also it's, you know, a common theme is how Donald Trump breaks norms, which is undoubtedly true. But mm -hmm. people don't think about how the media have just thrown away so many norms that were important. We don't ask uh, Chelsea Clinton some of these things about her father. We don't talk about to Ivanka Trump this way about her father, or we shouldn't. But now that these norms have been thrown out, what happens in the future? I think it's fine to question her. She's a White House official. But the notion that she's going to turn her father around on issues that he ran on something else. She doesn't think that that's realistic, and I don't think it's fair for the media. Interestingly, you know, uh, I report about the, uh, the leaks and the warfare between Ivanka and Jared and Steve Bannon, and there's a, there's a scene where uh, in, in the Oval Office in front of the president, she accuses Steve Bannon of leaking against them, and then he turns right around and accuses her of, of planning leaks. Uh, well, and, and it's and, what Donald Trump says after that that is most interesting in the book, uh, suggesting well, that she did leak, suggesting that he thinks she did leak. Uh, that's in dispute, but, but the president, yes, yes. you know, this was, of course, before Steve Bannon left. Um, you know, some of the stories, as I write in this book, are perfectly legitimate. Aggressive reporting on presidents is good. And sometimes the president creates his own distractions. So, for example, I didn't think he should have punched down and attacked uh, Mika Brzezinski of MSNBC over her supposed facelift. But... Uh, right after that, he was talking to an advisor and he said, what do you think? I know what you're going to say, unpresidential. And then he said, is North Korea off the TV? Yeah, the guy said. Is health care off the TV? Yeah, you have to say that. Sounds good to me. Yeah, well, a lot of people like to think that there's some grand strategy to the way Trump acts. Your book suggests that it's uh, more just who he is that is behind this, but that did suggest some strategy in that. Also, what's interesting is how much he talks about loyalty affecting some of his attacks on certain media people. He clearly thought Joe and Mika were friends who betrayed him. They had a friend clearly, in the at one time. Clearly thought that also about some NBC affiliates, and that does come through, and it does kind of help explain and contextualize some of what we've seen in some of these attacks on the media. What people don't understand, I'd like your thoughts on this, and I, I hit this theme in the book, is that negative coverage, and there has been, you know, just 
tidal wave of negative coverage helps Donald Trump. This was also true during the campaign. For one thing, he drives the media agenda because we love to talk and write about ourselves. Secondly, his supporters think the media don't like him. They also think much of the media disdain them. Talking about the people, you know, the 38 percent, the still 40 percent, rock solid for Donald Trump. Quick examples. The Huffington Post had a headline, a vote for Trump was a hate crime. And a salon columnist wrote about these culturally backward voters who supported Donald Trump. Let them lose their health care. Maybe they'll learn something this time around. Right. This is a common theme that you see among media, but also some people on the right. They don't understand that people identify with Trump so that when you attack Trump, it feels like an attack on uh, the, the voter or whatnot. And that is true for a lot of right of center voters who have dealt with that for decades, that attacks on Republicans feel as if the media are hostile to them. And this is certainly an example. Of right. I have no doubt uh, watching this day to day and, and working on this book that this constant warfare and it gets so personal at times does hurt both sides, but certainly it has hurt the media's credibility, which was already sinking before Donald Trump ever came on the political scene. Uh, and one of my concerns, and I know some of my friends in the press don't like this, is that there's lasting damage. I, I fear that there will be lasting damage uh, to the Trump presidency to, to the to the media long after Donald Trump is no longer president. Yeah, there's a line from someone in your book talking about how Donald Trump might not be crazy, but he certainly makes people crazy. Oh, actually, this, as Jared, Jared Kushner, Kushner told right. people, uh, it's, the word was unhinged. Yeah. Uh, people say he's unhinged, but he makes his critics unhinged. Donald Trump will only be president for another three to seven years. The media need to have credibility that, that is during that time, but also long after that time. And so the, the decisions that we make and how we cover people is so important so that people do feel they can trust media people to hold people accountable. Yeah, it was painful in some ways for me to write this book, but I do sort of feel like I would like many of my colleagues in the business, you know, some of whom are very fair as president, but many of whom don't realize how negative uh, this all is, to sort of re-examine the question of whether Trump is held to a different standard. It's very important for everyone to, to think that through. Uh, yeah, uh, because the justification is, well, he's a different kind of president, therefore we can have to treat him so differently than any other else who's ever worked in the White House. Molly, stick around for the panel coming up. And when we come back, even liberal commentators beating up on Chuck Schumer over the government shutdown is that wave of bad press. It showed that Chuck Schumer could take a position, and it showed that Chuck Schumer could hold it for two days. He couldn't hold the position. I think the Dems are in shock because they... They didn't, they didn't get the assist from the media that they had expected. They were Abbott without their Costello. Aww. And it was sad. We're back with the panel. Capri Cafaro, uh, liberals on your side, not happy with the Senate Democratic leader. Mm -hmm. Michelle Goldberg's New York Times column. Schumer sells out the resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, Talking Points memo called Schumer the face of retreat and a punching bag. It's not like he suddenly lost his media allies. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, at least for, for once, so to speak, uh, the, the media really has uh, been very fair on this. I mean, the Democrats um, are upset, progressives are upset, and frankly, Chuck Schumer did not do a good job um, by tying DACA to, to the spending bill. So I think that the, uh, the, the uh, coverage has been very accurate. Molly Hemingway, Schumer's overreach uh, on the Dreamers, I think, resulted in a rare media win for President Trump uh, after most pundits went in saying, well, he's going to bear the blame for any shutdown because he's president and they control both houses. Right. It was an interesting thing to see. A lot of the people going into this thought that no matter what happened, Republicans would be blamed. They weren't. It's also mm. true that initial losses aren't the same as ultimate losses, and this is a long ball game, and there's a lot left to be seen. Um, and also, I didn't see quite enough coverage of just how interesting the situation is on the left between the base and its leadership. Mm -hmm. That is posing a lot of problems, and we could really explore that more. Right. Well, you're right. That this that. fight isn't over. And what's been overshadowed, Shelby, is the latest negotiations on the very issue that led to the brief shutdown, right. uh, which is that President Trump offered to double the number of dreamers to 1.8 million who would have a path to citizenship in exchange for 25 billion dollars in funding the border wall and right. other mm -hmm. uh, immigration tightening measures now whether that's a good deal or not i haven't seen anybody in the media saying well you know what President Trump is really serious about helping other dreamers, and at least he's serious about these negotiations. Right, and it is a bit of a whirlwind when you want to keep track of this debate because the terms keep changing. Mm -hmm. And we saw Schumer after the shutdown come back and say, I'm taking the wall off right. the table. That's right. and it's, it's so confusing. It, it is a long game, and 
we have no idea where it will end up. And, but and, I will tell you who is not winning is the American people because there is right. no resolution on DACA. And some conservatives we very could have happy. Another with shut shutdowns with coming again. Some conservatives very happy, un, unhappy with the president's uh, compromise move on the dream. That's All right. right, let's get back to Molly's favorite subject. So the FBI, <laughs> the FBI text by these two agents who are having an affair, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page. Uh, they not only ripped Trump, but now uh, that the, somehow the FBI found the other 50,000 texts, we learned such things as they said that they can't go in loaded for bail in the investigation of Hillary Clinton because she's going to be our next president. But the rap is that some conservatives in the media are making this one giant distraction. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, this is a huge issue. The FBI and Department of Justice have only turned over a small percentage of the overall texts, and they're only ones supposedly related to right. the Clinton probe. It's 15% of the texts. But what we've seen already, there are a lot of things that just require more explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, and they were already, the texts were so troubling that Strzok was removed from the Mueller probe. So we know that the agency itself right. so thinks they were In fairness to Bob Mueller, uh, Strzok's been off this for months for after months. it came to Mueller's attention. Right. And so what, what is interesting, though, we have that they called the, the Russia investigation an insurance policy, that we can't afford to take the risk of the, of the Trump presidency. We have that they didn't turn over some documents to Congress because they were so inflammatory related to the Clinton probe of some kind. We have that Loretta Lynch only agreed to let Comey make the decision about Clinton because she knew that he was going to let her go. And we have some of this stuff that that really contradicts what James Comey said in his sworn testimony under oath. So this is, there is a lot here to probe and it's not just one or two texts. I, I, knew, yeah. that, I knew that Molly would read every text and would give us the best mm -hmm. one. Fantastic. Uh, now, even if you think- this She is, missed the one about the Putin calendar though. Even if you think these texts are not as big a deal mm -hmm. uh, because these are not the final decision makers, the coverage does say that this does not look good for two senior members of the FBI. Right. There's no question about that. I mean, I I think that, uh, you know, there are many people, uh, I would think, in, in the United States, myself included, that, you know, these two individuals are bad apples, bad actors, no question about it. They were removed. Um, and, and the coverage really is, is focused on these two individuals. So basically, uh, you know, it, in my view, it should not reflect on the entire operation of the FBI or the Department of Justice, where you have a lot of people that are, you know, working hard every day to ensure in an unbiased manner that, you know, th that law is, is you know, actually right. occurring. It, should, it shouldn't tar everybody who works for the Bureau. But Shelby Holiday, uh, what got overheated for a couple of days was a reference to a secret society right. at the FBI and a couple of Republican lawmakers were pushing this. It was treated like a smoking gun when we actually saw that text. It turned out to be a sarcastic reference uh, and there is no secret society. Well, and we need to see the rest of the text because it's really hard to understand all of these comments without the full context of what, what they were saying and what they were referring to. I have heard members, former members of the FBI come out and say, yeah, it's pretty typical that we have off-site meetings. I mean, senior leaders need to make decisions about promotions. So in one sentence, is, promotions this, and is the story about the continuing uh, disclosures of the text uh, overplayed or not? I think the American people deserve to know if the FBI is tainted, but I, I don't. I, I think it's overplayed, it's overhyped at this point because we really don't have all the information. All right. And we need, want it, I get and it. And we need but to get we some more. All right. Yeah. Shelby Holiday, Capri Cafaro, Molly Hemingway, thanks very much for a great couple of seconds. After the break, Megyn Kelly escalates her feud with Jane Fonda, ripping her for supporting the communists in North Vietnam. And some of her fellow pundits don't like it. Ended when Megan asked her about it and has continued to pick pock shots. Now Megan is pushing back hard. I have no regrets about that question. Nor am I in the market for a lesson from Jane Fonda on what is and is not appropriate. After all, this is a woman whose name is synonymous with outrage. Look at her treatment of our military during the Vietnam War. Many of our veterans still call her Hanoi Jane. Thanks to her radio broadcast, which attempted to shame American troops, she posed on an anti-aircraft gun used to shoot down our American pilots. She called our POWs hypocrites and liars and referred to their torture as understandable. Uh, to yeah. drag the yeah. Vietnam War into a plastic surgery conversation <laughs> is a real stretch, Megan, okay? Not Jane should have just said to her, and how much work have you had, bitch? Yeah. Well, Whoa, is right. Joining us now from New York, Carly Shimkus, a reporter for Fox News 24-7 headlines on Sirius XM. Jane Fonda deserves an Academy oh. Award for best performance for manufactured outrage. And after four months now, these pot shots, uh, Megyn Kelly brought out the heavy artillery and went after her on Vietnam. Was that a good moment for her or not? 
Uh, I, th I think it was an understandable moment for Megyn Kelly. Usually I don't think it's a good idea to use your TV show as a platform to settle personal scores. You're not supposed to be the story. You're supposed to be above it all. Uh, but all of that changed when Jane Fonda went back on the Today Show and criticized Megyn Kelly in front of Megyn Kelly's co-workers. At that point, she probably said, all right, enough is enough. I have a, a reputation to uphold and I am going to defend it. Right, but it was a follow-up to a segment on her same show. And if Jane Fonda look you know i like her movies but she's going to keep jabbing megan about this perhaps to get attention uh at the age of 80 isn't it fair game for the host to bring up really the most shameful episode of her career and one for which she had partially apologized posing uh with that anti-aircraft gunner in hanoi yeah, you know, listen, nobody forced Jane Fonda to take that picture. I think that that moment is always going to be fair game uh, when you're talking about her life and her career. Uh, but interestingly enough, the media coverage uh, was really uh, sort of anti uh, Megyn Kelly. You played that moment uh, from The View. Joy Behar not only called Megyn Kelly uh, the B word, she also defended Jane Fonda's Hanoi Jane moment. So I think that a lot of the reasons that uh, the ladies on The View um, defended Jane Fonda were strictly political, but it has been a very, very rough year for right. Megyn Kelly in terms of media coverage. Well, I have noticed that when Megyn Kelly, when she was here at Fox News, she, when she goes after a Dick Cheney, then the liberal press loves her. When she goes after somebody who's more of a liberal icon like Jane Fonda, she gets a lot of bad press and also damaging leaks. So why do you, th you think there's also maybe a jealousy factor because she uh, went in of the way she went uh, to NBC, that some of these her fellow pundits are... Uh, uh, are taking shots at her now for daring to ask a celebrity a real question? Yeah, possibly. I mean, some of the headlines uh, in surrounding Megyn Kelly, I think, have been fair. Others, I think, um, sometimes the media is just trying to uh, continue the narrative of drama surrounding her, her career at NBC. Um, but I do have to say, Megyn Kelly's show uh, is supposed to be sort of a lighthearted daytime talk show. And so the moment where she did criticize Jane Fonda to that extent wasn't really what her show was supposed to be all well, about. Well, you know what? I think that's too narrow. You can have a show and you can can do serious stuff and you can have lighter moments too. I sometimes try to do that here. Let me ask you about Oprah Winfrey because she's now told in Style Magazine she's not running for president. Ah. It's not in her DNA, she says. I shouldn't say this, but I said all along this was just a lot of media speculation, overheated to be sure. Your thoughts. What does this say? What are we going to do? Oprah's not going to run for president. How are we going to survive this? I'm not surprised at all that Oprah isn't running for president. When you are that popular, why would you ever ruin it by <laughs> running for office? Everybody already loves you and if you you know run for a political position half the country is going to hate you i think that she's and doing just fine without uh being having politics yeah. on her wikipedia and page journalists all knew this but they couldn't resist they love to fuel the speculation they'd love to have oprah versus the donald uh, yeah. that's not happening it was never happening and now we know for sure carly shipkiss great to see you this good time. to see you too thanks very much still to come president trump's harshest critic at espn is off the air